everyone. For today's lesson, we are going to learn how to find the probabilities of independent events. So the first part of this lesson of 10.5 is going to be over independent events, and then the second lesson will be about dependent events. Before we get started, I would like you to please use Pascal's triangle to find the product of 3x minus 2 raised to the fourth power. I want you to pause the video and try this problem on your own, and when you have an answer, please go ahead and restart the video. All right, so because this is a binomial raised to the fourth power, that means that we're going to use the fourth row of Pascal's triangle. And Pascal's triangle is 1, 4, 6, 4, 1 in the fourth row. So I'm going to use, uh, write down these numbers vertically. 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. And I'm going to multiply these numbers by my first term. My first term is 3x, and I'm going to put 3x into parentheses just to make sure that I show proper work. Then I'm going to take that first term, and I'm going to raise it to the fourth power, then the third power, then the second power, the first power, and then the zero power. And I'm going to multiply that by my second term, which is 2. And I'm going to raise 2 to the zero power, first power, second power, third power, and fourth power. <clears throat> so now I'm going to simplify each individual term individually, so one at a time. So I have three to the fourth power, and three to the fourth power, that is equal to 81. So this is 81x to the fourth power. Anything to the zero power is just one. For the next term, I'm going to take care of my exponents first. 3 to the third power is 27. 27 times 4, and then timesing that by 2, will give you a number 216. So that's 216x to the third power. Then we have 3 squared, which is 9, and then 2 squared, which is 4. So 6 times 9 times 4, that is also equal to 216. Now this is going to be x squared. Then I'm going to raise 3 to the first power, which is 3, and then 2 to the third power, which is 8. So we have 4 times 3 times 8, and that is equal to 96. So we now have 96x. And then finally, anything to the zero power is just 1. So 1 times 1 times 2 to the fourth, which is 16. So because our sign in between our terms is a negative or a minus, that tells me that I'm going to alternate my signs. So I'm going to start with a positive term, which is 81x to the fourth. Then I'm going to write minus 216x to the third, then plus 216x squared, then minus 96x, then plus 16. And that is my answer. Hopefully you got this answer correct and was able to show the proper work. And if you struggled with this problem, please make sure that you let me know, and we can certainly go through more problems just like it. So like I said, this lesson is about um, identifying the probability of independent events, and so that is your first learning target. I can find the probability of independent events, and I can tell the difference between mutually exclusive events and independent events. So that's going to be coming up in the second video. Right now, we're just going to be focusing on independent events. So what is an independent event? Well, two events are called independent if the occurrence of one event has no effect on the occurrence of the other. So if the occurrence of one event has no impact or no effect or influence on the outcome of another, those two events are considered independent. An example of that would be if a coin is tossed twice, the outcome of the first toss whether it's a head or a tail, has absolutely no effect on whether on the outcome, on whether or not the second toss will give us a head or a tail. Each one of those events are independent of one another. They have no influence on one another. So how do you find the probability? Well, the probability of independent events, let's call those two events A and B. Let's say that we want to figure out that what's the probability of, of like, like tossing a coin and it landing on a tail and then tossing a coin again and it landing on another tail. Well, those are two independent events. So what is the probability that both of those events actually take place? 
Notice that we have the word and in between. The probability of A and B is going to be equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. The probability of rolling a tail or flipping a coin and, and having it land on tails would be one half times the probability of it landing on a tail again. That's one half. So that's going to be one fourth would be an example uh, of the, finding the probability of independent events. So in general, the probability that n independent events occurs is the product. We're going to be multiplying. It's the product of n probabilities of the individual events. So we're going to be multiplying all of our probabilities together. So looking at example number one, it says for a fundraiser, a class sells 150 raffle tickets for a mall gift certificate. And they sell 200 raffle tickets for a booklet of movie passes. You buy five raffle tickets for each prize. So you put your, your, your name into the bucket for both prize five times each. We want to figure out what is the probability that you will win both prizes. So whenever we write down our probabilities, we always start down with writing P and then in parentheses what we're trying to find the probability of. So we want to find the probability that you're going to win a gift certificate and that you're going to win the movie passes. So what is the probability that you're going to win the gift certificate and the movie passes? Well, each event, each raffle, each drawing is independent of one another. If you win the raffle that has no bearing, uh, or the first raffle that has no bearing on whether or not you're going to win the second raffle. So in our first raffle, you bought five tickets and they sold 150. So five out of 150 um, is going to have your name on it. Five out of the 150 raffle tickets will have your name on it. Times. You bought five raffle tickets for the other, and 200 tickets were sold. So now we're going to multiply those two together. So this is where I would, a strategy would be simplifying each fraction individually. You could multiply straight across and then use math, enter, enter, but that could end up leading to larger numbers than maybe what your calculator can handle or maybe what you can handle. So it might be in your best interest to in, in, independently simplify each fraction. So 5 over 150, that's equivalent to 1 over 30. Times 5 over 200, that simplifies to 1 over 40. And 1 over 30 times 1 over 40 is equal to 1 out of 1,200. So you have a 1 out of 1,200 chance of winning both prizes. Let's go ahead and look at example number 2. It says a spinner is divided into 10 equal regions. We're going to number those regions from 1 to 10. What is the probability that the three consecutive spins result in perfect squares? So let's go, I would recommend that whenever you have problems like these, list your numbers. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then 10. And out of those numbers, we need to identify our perfect squares. One is considered a perfect square. It is not considered prime, so just keep that in mind. It is not prime, it's considered a perfect square. Four is a perfect square, and nine is a perfect square. So we want to figure out what is the probability that three consecutive spins will result in either a one, four, or a nine. So I'm going to write the probability that you end up with a perfect square, and then a perfect square, and then a perfect square. Sometimes whenever you see, instead of writing the word and over and over, you might see commas in between that indicates the word and. So we have the prob probability of coming up with a perfect square. There's three of them that are perfect squares. So that's three out of the 10 digits are perfect squares times three out of 10 times three out of 10. And when you multiply straight across, you're going to end up with 27 out of 1,000. So you have a 27 out of 1,000 chance of ending up with three consecutive spins of having a perfect square appear each time. Let's look at example number three. It says, during each of five days of secretary week, a secretary is randomly given one of 10 prizes. All of the prizes are available each day, but one of the prizes is the $500 gift certificate. What is the probability that the secretary that the secretary receives the $500 prize at least once. So a secretary is randomly selected, and what is the probability that they receive the $500 gift certificate at least once? 
whenever you see at least, one of our strategies has been to work with compliments. And this would be a good time to work with compliments. So that's what I'm going to suggest that you think about. Think about working with compliments. That means that I'm going to subtract. Or find the, so if I wanted to find the probability that you win the $500 prize at least once, Instead, we're going to go one minus the probability that you win less than once. So less than once would mean that each day out of the week you win one of the other nine prizes. So the probability of winning the, the $500 prize less than once or the probability of winning the $500 prize zero times in five weeks is what this means. So I'm going to write one minus. Now, the probability of winning less than once means that on Monday, you like have the chances of winning nine out of ten, or nine, the other nine prizes. So that's going to be eliminated from your choices times the probability on Tuesday of you being selected and you win one of the other prizes times Wednesday, you win one of the other nine prizes. You don't win the nine, the $500 gift certificate. Thursday, nine out of 10, and then Friday, nine out of 10. So what I have here is I have the probability that you win all of the other prizes, that, that probability is taken into consideration and we're taking or removing the $500 prize from each day, saying that you did not win, you won one of the other nine each of the other days. So I'm going to go 1 minus, and uh, 9 tenths times itself 5 times is approximately 0.59. So that's 1 minus 0.59, and that is equal to 0.41. This would be a time when you would probably want to work with decimals instead of fractions. Um, and I would always let you know when decimals are more appropriate than fractions. So you have a 41% chance of winning the $500 prize at least once. That's what this means. You have a 41% chance of winning the $500 prize or the $500 gift certificate at least once. All right, we have one last example, and then we are finished for today. <clears throat> All right, so for example number four, it says, find the probabilities of drawing the given cards from a standard deck of 52 cards. You replace each card, you replace each card after you have drawn the card. So if you've replaced the card, that means that each time that you try to grab another card, you always start back at 52 cards. So remember when I said that sometimes that they just separate everything with commas instead of calling it and? We assume that the commas indicate the word and. So this means what is the probability of drawing an ace first and then a seven and then a face card, replacing your cards each time you draw. So because of room purposes, I'm going to go work, show my work vertically. And so for the first one, we have the probability of, an, of drawing an ace and then a seven and then a face card. So aces, I know that there are a total of four aces out of the 52 cards, and let's say I end up winning. Awesome. I'm going to replace that card back, and now I'm starting with 52 again. That's what with replacement means. Now there are four sevens in the deck of 52, and then I'm going to multiply that by my face cards. There are a total of 12 face cards out of the 52. Now, like I said to you guys before, it might be in your best interest to simplify your fractions before multiplying straight across. That might make your answer a little bit more manageable and easier to work with. So that's one out of four over 52 can be simplified to one over 13. Four over 52 is one over 13. And 12 out of 52, that is three over 13. Multiplying straight across, we end up with three out of uh, 2,197. So the probability that you're gonna get an ace, then a seven, then a face card is three out of 2,197. Let's go ahead and look at B. For letter B, we're looking at the probability of getting a red two, then getting another red two, then getting a black two. So think about how the colors. We have two different colors, red and black. 
two of them, are, so two of the suits, um, hearts and diamonds, those are your red cards, and spades and clubs, those are your black cards. So how many red twos exist? Well, two out of the 52 card deck. How many red twos are, exist? Two out of the 52. How many black twos exist? Two out of the 52. So I'm going to simplify each fraction, and I end up with 1 out over 26 times 1 over 26 times 1 over 26. And when I multiply straight across, I end up with 1 over 17,576. That's the chances that, or the, the probability that you're going to end up with a red 2, then a red 2, then a black 2. So let's go ahead and look at letter C. Letter C says, what is the probability that you're going to end up with a heart? then a black club, and then a three. So our hearts, there are a total of 13 cards in each suit, so 13 out of the 52 are hearts. Black cards, well half of the deck is black cards and half of 52 is 26. So 26 out of 52. Then we have the number three. There are four threes in the, the deck of cards, so four out of 52. I'm going to simplify each fraction. 13 out of 52 is 1 fourth. 26 out of 52 is 1 half. And 4 out of 52, that is 1 thirteenth. And when you multiply straight across, you're going to end up with 1 out of 104. So you have a 1 out of 104 chance of selecting a heart, and then a black card, and then on the number 3. And that is the end of this lesson. If you have any questions over anything, please feel free to email me. Otherwise, I hope you have a wonderful day.